Hi, everybody. Welcome to the library. I just want to make a couple announcements before we get started today. Um, next month's Brown Bag will be about the uh, restoration of the Red Oak Victory Ship, which is part of the Rosie the Riveter Museum. So that should be an interesting one. We also are having a special event for seniors in on November sixth in this room. It'll be Stage Bridge Senior Theater Company coming to do a storytelling performance. So I hope you can join us for that. And we are starting to take votes for what, what will be the next book for the Albany Reads. We're going to be doing another citywide reading program. So if you want to pick up a ballot, we have someone back and you can turn in your ballot within the next couple of weeks and have a say in what the next book will be. So today we are happy to have Merrick Brager and Peter Nigerian here to share their writing about the immigrant experience. Please welcome Merrick Brager. See if you can hear me. Thank you very much. It's very amplified over here. I, I just published a book this summer called The City in the Fields, Multicultural Themes in Modern California Literature. And I'll read a little bit of the opening and then I'll read about my favorite writer, William Saroyan. If I can go back and find what... So. Uh, what America is to the world, Robert Penn Warren once wrote in reference to John Steinbeck, California is to America. California's literature reflects major themes of American literature in terms of dreams of refuge for the oppressed, justice for the poor, dreams of new beginnings. California literature is multi-regional and multicultural, and its realism illustrates just how far we have come and how far we need to go in this volatile state of 38 million souls to achieve true equality. My grandparents were Jewish immigrants from the Ukraine who settled in Chicago and came to America in search of freedom. A generation later, their children and grandchildren came to California, as did so many of my classmates and parents, in search of a more open, democratic life. California was not only a place of physical beauty, but also a place where white Oklahomans and Louisiana blacks, Italian fishermen and Portuguese farmers, Chinese laborers, Sikhs, Mexican field workers, elderly Armenian refugees came in search of a better life and so many more. Yet we knew and know so little about each other despite a powerful regional literature as powerful as any in America. I discovered Steinbeck and Saroyan in high school and reading them gave me a place to stand for both men were part of a specific California region and people and both could see themselves in others. We were all, to quote my San Francisco State history teacher, Moses Rishon, quote, the children and grandchildren of immigrants and minority groups, and that should unite us rather than divide us. And so my books, An Examination of California Literature from the Beginning of the 20th Century with Jack London to the End of the 20th Century with Amy Tan and the Beginning of the 21st with Gerald Haslam. My themes are both universal and multicultural and still, I believe, foundational for all the new California writers who are working in the tradition of London, John Steinbeck, and William Saroyan. Uh, this is uh, called Saroyan's Legacy. Saroyan was my uh, favorite writer and I think had more impact on me when I started out than anyone. So here's the essay called Saroyan's Legacy. It starts with a quote from Saroyan. If I want to do anything, I want to speak a more universal language that which is eternal and common to all races. William Saroyan. California's greatest ethnic writer in his lifetime was many men. He was a son devastated by the early loss of his father, a child of Armenian immigrants and therefore a member of an oppressed people, a Fresno newsboy, a telegraph messenger, a high school dropout, a field worker, a San Francisco t a dock worker, a Bohemian, a drinker, a gambler, a playwright, an essayist, a short story writer, a storyteller, a novelist, a brother, son, uncle, failed husband, single father, and grandfather. Saroyan was, as Gary Soto has written, one of the greatest writers of the century. He was also a personality, a force, a prose poet, as colorful as Mark Twain, proud as Cyrano de Bergerac, with as much energy as a young Groucho Marx. 
Sirwain was an ethnic writer long before the advent of ethnic literature. In a time of prejudice against Asian Americans, he reached out to help contemporaries like his Japanese-American friend Toshio Mori, helping Mori get his first book published. He wrote not only of immigrant Armenians, but of American Greeks and Jews, Italians and Irish, Filipinos and Blacks, Arabs and Mexicans, Assyrians, Czechs, Poles, Russians, and Japanese. He wrote of Finland and New York and Armenia, but most of all he wrote of California. And he knew by intuition what those calling themselves multiculturalists today have yet to understand. To write proudly about one's own people, Soroyan demonstrated, does not mean a lesser commitment to the many peoples of America. Writing from the inside of an ethnic culture, Soroyan illustrated, can lead one toward sympathy for other cultures. Indeed, ethnic awareness for Soroyan led him away from a stance of isolation and separatism and towards universal understandings. Soroyan wrote of the joy and pain of childhood, the poignancy of time's passage. He argued again and again that accepting our mortality our closeness to death should lead us toward lives of dignity and honor. From his first published book in 1934 when he was 26 to his last published work before his death in 1981 at the age of 72, Soroyan published more than 40 volumes of stories, plays, essays, novels, and autobiographies. Of his more than 50 stories, I will focus on four of Soroyan's most telling pieces those illustrating his world, a place where one can be simultaneously fully ethnic, fully American, fully human. And here's the stories. The Filipino and the Drunkard was, is one of Soroyan's strongest pieces. Those who have read only a little of Soroyan, the human comedy, or My Name is Aram, will be surprised, I think, by the controlled anger behind the story. Based on a true life incident that happened on the San Francisco to Oakland Ferry before the Bay Bridge was built, it is a story that fully exposes racist evil and indicts those who stand by while evil takes place. A World War I veteran, enraged at the presence of a non-white on the deck of the ferry, begins to torment a young Filipino. The veteran's racism is made explicit, and Soroyan shows how false patriotism often serves as a mask for supranationalism. The veteran states, Now get back! I fought 24 months in, fr in France. I'm a real American. I don't want you standing here among white people. The veteran drunkenly chases the Filipino into the washroom, threatening the young man's life. None of the passengers on the ferry intervene, and the Filipino in self-defense uses his knife to kill his assailant. The Filipino's final speech is an indictment of all who stand by while the innocent are oppressed. He, he says, I did not want to hurt him. Why didn't you stop him? Is it right to chase a man like a rat? You knew he was drunk. I did not want to hurt him, but he would not let me go. He tore my coat and tried to choke me. I told him I would kill him if he would not go away. It is not my fault. I must go to Oakland to see my brother. He is sick. Do you think I am looking for trouble when my brother is sick? Why didn't you stop him? Soroyan in the Filipino and the Drunkard shows us that being a bystander to evil and doing nothing is to be an accessory to evil. He shows us further that bigotry based on race is totally indefensible. Soroyan's ability to write about ethnic groups different from his own is especially compelling. His Armenian experience, two million of his people murdered at the hands of the Turks, and his Armenian-American experience in his hometown of Fresno, Armenians were restricted in housing until after World War II, moved Soroyan to identify with other victims of prejudice. The broken wheel is a short story told from within a close Armenian-American family in Fresno. The story is not straight autobiography, but is like many of Soroyan's stories, based on Soroyan's true life situation. Soroyan's mother, following the death of her husband, raised a family of four children, two girls and two boys, with a courage that did not mask the essential tragedy of the family situation. Mrs. Sandoval, the Mexican-American woman who loses her son in the human comedy, and Mrs. Macaulay, the Irish-American widow in the same novel, are projections of Soroyan's mother. Soroyan's Armenian-American stories are grounded in ethnic detail, and Soroyan provides us with Armenian names and phrases, but the impact of the broken wheel relies on the poignance of the family situation. 
of a family sobered by death, unbowed by poverty, unified by love. The story's key figure is the mother, a young widow. Despite the loss of the father, the mother, the family is a happy one. But the happiness is touched by an awareness of sorrow. The youngest child, a boy, narrates, quote, In the winter we laughed a great deal. We would be sullen and sorrowful for weeks at a time, and then suddenly all of us would begin to laugh. End of quote. In the summer, the mother's brother, Uncle Vahan, would visit. An immigrant, young Vahan, has become an attorney in San Francisco. He tells the family, We do not know how fortunate we are to be in a country such as this. Opportunities are unlimited. He speaks with happiness and confidence, but Soroyan will bring us here the opposite of the sentimental American success story. Tragedy visits the family again. First, a seemingly meaningless event takes on great meaning for the narrator. The brothers for years have shared a bicycle, the older brother pumping the younger brother who sits on the crossbar. One afternoon, the fork cracks, and the author describes the break as a sudden awareness of the passage of time, as a sort of death and rebirth. When the fork breaks, he experiences it as coming out of an endless dream. The narrator suddenly is conscious of himself and his family becoming older, of his two sisters' love for the family and his brother and his times of growing up. He remembers, quote, the time I nearly drowned in the King's River and quicker my brother swam out to me, shouting frantically in Armenian, the time Lucy lost her job at Woolworths and cried a week, the time Naomi was ill with pneumonia and we all prayed she wouldn't die. The stories concludes with the family learning of Uncle Van's death in World War I. And with the narrator describing his mother, who has told the tearful children, we have always had our disappointments and hardships, and we have always come out of them, and we always shall. The narrator awakens from sleep at night and observes his mother's suffering. I saw that my mother has taken her brother's photograph from the piano. She had placed it before her on the table, and I could hear her weeping softly, and I could hear her swaying her head from side to side, the way people from the old country do. If ever a story acknowledges the strength of women, this one does. If ever a story is both an ethnic and universal rendering, this one, this one is. The, de the death of children integrates Soroyan's Armenian-American experience with the experience of other ethnic Americans. In his collection, The Man with His Heart in the, the, Heart in the Highlands, Soroyan's familiarity with creatures around him allowed him to write of a Greek waiter in the struggle of Jim Petros with death, an Italian-American schoolboy in laughter, an Oklahoma migrant family in oranges, African-Americans in Peace It's Wonderful, American Indians in the Third Day After Christmas, another important story of the 30s with the Hey Nani Nani sympathetically described a Mexican-American farm worker involved in a strike. In several stories published before World War II, culminating with his uh, Pulitzer Prize-winning play, The Time of Your Life, Soroyan made the fate of European's Jewish population a specific concern. His own family had, had suffered genocide, and he understood early the, more, the meaning of Nazi brutality and racism. In The Death of Children, Soroyan recalls his fourth grade class, he portrays the multi-ethnic nature in a single sentence. There were all kinds of us. Then describes two girls and two boys of his class. There was Rose Tapia, the little Mexican girl, quote unquote, who Soroyan remembers representing the rhythm of song. There was Carson, the Southern migrant boy who lived with his parents in a tent somewhere south of the SP tracks, who because of poverty came to school in the winter without shoes. The other boys taunt the migrant, who becomes mean and sullen, but Soroyan is convinced that Carson was ashamed of his meanness. There is Alice Schwab, the teacher's favorite, the, the daughter of, Jewish, of a Jewish watchmaker who dies tragically that year in the flu epidemic. And finally, there is the Armenian boy, witness to massacre, whom Soroyan identifies as his brother. The Armenian boy speaks to Soroyan in Armenian following recess, and tells them what he had witnessed, what their people have suffered. And their house was burning, and he could see men being struck by soldiers with whips and blades, and he could hear screaming and praying, and then they killed his father before his eyes. 
and his mother became insane with grief. And along the roads he saw the bodies of dead men and women, and the bodies of dead children. And all over the country it was the same, and everywhere were the bodies of children who had died. Here Saroyan is like the Jewish writers who, after the Holocaust, have seen it as an obligation to tell the truth of what took place. Reading this story, our students, Vietnamese and Cambodian American future writers, might find a way of eventually giving voice to the horrors they have seen. 70,000 Assyrians is perhaps Saroyan's most compelling statement about ethnicity, American assimilation, and brotherhood. The story is said in 1933 at the Barber College on 3rd Street in San Francisco, Skid Row. It is the height of the Depression, and at the Barber College, Saroyan meets a number of suffering men. There is a kid he calls Iowa, who is out of work, hungry, far from his native Midwest, looking desperately for any kind of job, looking for a place in the world. There is the Japanese-American barber with whom Saroyan quickly establishes a rapport. For Saroyan exchanges words with the barber in Japanese, words he had learned working in the fields years before in Fresno. The Japanese-American barber and Saroyan have mutual friends. Finally, Saroyan meets the Assyrian barber, Theodore Bedal, who Saroyan first mistakes as a fellow Armenian. Bedal and Saroyan speak to each other, and Saroyan becomes discouraged, perceiving that Bedal has lost himself spiritually by giving up on his Assyrian ancestry. Bedal said, I cannot read Assyrian. I was born in the old country, but I want to get over it. Saroyan comments, these remarks were painful to me in Armenian. I had always felt badly about my own people being destroyed. Bedal tells Saroyan that there are only 70,000 Assyrians left in the world, and the Arabs are still killing us, he says. They killed 70 of us in a little uprising last month, 70 more destroyed. Saroyan, who has not given up hope for an independent Armenia, sees Bedal, despite himself representing his people, quote, himself 70,000 Assyrians and still being himself the whole race. He does not accept that Bedal has given up on his ancestry. Saroyan embraces here the hope that we can retain our ethnicity and yet be fully American. His idea of America was a place encompassing many cultures, a haven to the impress, to the oppressed. America was for him the place articulated by Emma Lazarus in her poem on the Statue of Liberty. It was the place that later Martin Luther King dreamed of and Robert Kennedy campaigned for. It is a vision of the United States we should not let die. Saroyan wrote many stories of many kinds, most less tragic than the four I've discussed here. He was consistent always in his respect for other cultures and his feeling for the frailty of life. In our time of bitterness and polemics, reading Saroyan might help restore our appreciation of the eternal truths. We need to expand, not limit our ideas about culture and ethnicity. Anyone who calls himself or herself a multiculturalist and sees all of those of European ancestry as the same as simply spreading bigotry. Further, to the extent multiculturalists den deny the tremendous diversity and individuality among members of every ethnic group, denial will be a, f a measure of failure. And then I kind of conclude, I was in the, with my hospital experience a few years ago. Uh, in late June, I spent 11 days at Kaiser Hospital in Hayward after undergoing successful major surgery. My surgeon, to whom I owe much, was Dr. Peterson, a Swedish-American, originally from Visalia. My grandparents were Russian Jews who fled pogroms to come to the United States, and my late grandfather, the sculptor Joseph Gilden, lost relatives in the Holocaust. My roommates, all facing serious diagnoses, included a Filipino World War II veteran, a Latino father of two young children, an Air Force Vietnam era veteran who was one quarter Native American, and a retired naval captain from Harlan County, Kentucky, who took place in the Normandy invasion. My nurses were black, white, Hispanic, Filipino, Chinese, and other nationalities. With the doctors, nurses, and my fellow patients, our ethnicity was at times a topic of conversation, but never the focus of relationship. All of us shared, it seemed to me, an awareness of the closeness of death and an appreciation of life in the face of this reality. We live in a more multicultural society than the multiculturalists admit. Our society in many ways has transcended race. A multiculturalism that does not explore our hu common humanity betrays the essence of literature. 
for we are all, to again quote Soroyan, individual human beings, quote, miraculously living things never more than a day from death, never, never far from glory. Okay, th thanks, thanks a lot. And uh, should I read one? Pete, ready to go? You got 10 more, 10 more minutes, 10 more minutes to go. Okay. And I pronounce my name, Marek Brager. But my name's always uh, mispronounced, so that's, that's okay with me. Uh, I have a whole lot of these. And uh, let's see if I can do it. Uh, when I was in high school, I had a creative writing teacher who became a kind of an uh, important California writer. And he was a good teacher too, so I'm a high school uh, teacher taking off today, and uh, I'll read this in appreciation of him if I can find it, which I'm going through right here. Okay, Valley Memories. Uh, this is a really good, powerful microphone. Boy, I haven't, I haven't so can this, is it too loud for you guys? Is this okay? Okay. During a cray, uh, excuse me, I'll start over. During a gray, cold winter day in 1970, in the college library, I found the short story Sanchez by Richard Doki in a back issue of the Southwest Review. I felt the pride of place you feel at the success of someone you know, in this case, my high school creative writing teacher. It had been a year, more than a year, since I'd been a student of Doki's at Lincoln High School in Stockton, a year that seemed now that I was in college to have taken place in eternity before. Yet Doki's lessons were vivid to me. He taught us to see as a writer sees, to look at life with an eye toward capturing a moment in time. He spoke to us of how he as a writer viewed Skid Row Stockton, how he noted the look of the facade of an old brick hotel, or stopped to observe the way a Filipino field worker held his cigarette, or listened to the way rain sounded on a downtown street in spring. Richard Doki saw Stockton with a poet's eyes and he imparted some of that poetry to us. He told us to write of our own experience. He taught Hemingway and Steinbeck from a writer's point of view. We saw because of him writers as people who created out of the same emotions we experienced. His criticism was constructive and precise. Today, Doki's writing is recognized. His story, Sanchez, has been anthologized a dozen times. And James uh, Houston, Gary Soto, Gerald Haslam, all have included his work with the best of California and West Coast writing. Doki's nonfiction narrative, Going in Naked, can be found in California Childhood. And his major collection of short stories, August Heat, is available from Story Press. Another excellent story collection called entitled Sundown is available through Seven Buffaloes Press. What I best remember, though, and appreciate are Doki's qualities as a teacher. He did for us what I try to do for my writing st students now, which is to help high school seniors slow down, observe, trust their best instincts, and so catch the beauty and poignance and poetry of themselves alive upon an earth moving so quickly through time. Even now, I can still picture myself and my baseball teammate and childhood friend, Tom Gulick, walking home on a March afternoon of our senior year following Doki's class. We lit cigarettes and we smoked under the long overcast sky and we could smell the coming rain. We were not boys and not yet men, though Tom would be married before he was 20 and his son now is older than we were then. We walked past the tall valley oaks, graceful with dark haunted branches. Instead of talking about baseball, Tom and I spoke about the writers we admired and the places they had described. We spoke of Steinbeck, Salinas, and Monterey, of Mark Twain's Mississippi River, of Hemingway's Michigan, of Kerouac's Lowell, Massachusetts. And we wanted to see the places we'd read about. And we spoke of our childhood now passing and we felt the truth of what William Soroyan once called the warm, quiet valley of home. We walked between the coast range and the Sierra and looked west to Mount Diablo, the mountain that overlooked our youth. We longed to leave the valley forever and to never look back. And at the same time, we wanted to, we wanted to never leave Stockton, never to leave home. We felt that our 
We felt the poetry that our teacher, Richard Doki, never called poetry. And we felt, too, encouraged by our teacher, that in writing we might capture what otherwise might be forever lost. Okay, thanks. Good. Thank you. Ready to go, Pete? Well, okay. Uh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't have to use them necessarily. Any, I, have, I have very bad hearing, but if anybody has a question for five minutes, I think we'll go with Pete. Uh, I met, I, I, the last time I saw Peter Nigerian was for actually 45 years ago. He, 40, 40 years ago. He published a book called Voyages that was, a, a, I think, a great book. And uh, I was going to San Francisco State, and a friend of mine who wanted to be a painter and I, uh, unannounced, knocked on his door. And uh, he was very kind to us and very nice to us. So thanks, Peter, and uh, a very important, very good writer. Peter, Niger, Peter Nigerian. Yeah, he he didn't know it at the time, but Soroyan uh, was a father figure for me. I didn't have a father, and uh, well, Voyages had just gotten published then, 1971 actually, and Soroyan wrote a little note uh, to my publisher that he really liked the book. It meant a lot to me. Uh, Soroyan was uh, my mother's age. A little bit younger than my mother was born 1905, and Soroyan, I think, was born 1908. And, uh, but Soroyan uh, was born in this country. He didn't ex experience the, uh, he didn't experience the uh, massacre of Armenians in Turkey because he, his family had come uh, in the uh, earlier on, before, uh, before before 1900. The massacre was in 1915. And uh, so my mother uh, was a survivor of that massacre. She was, uh, uh, she was about nine or 10. And, uh, and then she came to this country uh, in 1921. And uh, <clears throat> my father was her second husband. I was born late in 1940. And uh, so uh, I'm, uh, I wrote that first book, uh, which was largely about my father. Uh, and, uh, and then years passed, and uh, I wrote a, uh, a novel uh, about, uh, uh, it's, it's about actually an artist who's trying to, uh, Paint the picture of his square, his mother's mother. My my mother did, couldn't remember her mother's face. Uh, she remembered her mother, but it, couldn't remember her mother's face clearly. And uh, so the uh, the novel is based on my personal experience of uh, wondering uh, what my grandmother looked like. And uh, I became an artist while I was writing this book. And so I. Uh, the, the, the main, the, the narrator of the book is an artist trying to imagine what his, um, what his mother's mother looks like. And, uh, and in, ma in the, trying to imagine this, he has to encounter uh, the massacre where his grandmother was killed and that his mother survived. And so, uh, so this book I wrote uh, is about that story and it was published in, I wrote it in 1980, but it was published in 1986 uh, by a small press here in Berkeley. Um, and um, I did the, uh, the cover. The cover's supposed to be the grandmother, but actually I, was, I did a practice painting of my mother from a, from a passport photo. So this is actually my mother when she was uh, 16. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to, uh, and then uh, recently, not too long ago, I wrote a non-fiction book about my mother, uh, and that's largely about her decline uh, in the nursing home, and, uh, and that book is called The Artist and His Mother. 
Uh, the title is from a famous painting by an Armenian painter uh, who did a painting of him and his mother surviving the massacre, which was called The Artist and His Mother. So that's the background uh, of what I'm going to read. And um, uh, now this book, The Orders of Memory, is a novel, and I told you that it's it's narrated by an artist who's trying to imagine what his grandmother looked like, and uh, it's partly you know, his mother's in here as a young girl, as a girl, and so forth and so on. But this novel is, uh, as the novel progresses, there are uh, there's a chorus. Now, a chorus in uh, in Greek in Greek uh, tragedies old ancient Greek tragedies. A chor the chorus is a, a body uh, uh, of several uh, singers who comment on the tragedy. And that the chorus is always used on the side of the, the, the tragedy, the ancient Greek tragedy. Now, in my book, I have a chorus. My book is not really a tragedy though it has very sad moments to it. But, um, and the, but I have a chorus, and these, this chorus is, uh, I imagine these four old Armenian women uh, and, um, who, are, who have uh, come from where my mother and I came from. We, my mother, uh, I was born in West Hoboken, New Jersey, which is across the river from Manhattan, and uh, and uh, that in in this com in West Hoboken was a community of Armenians who, like my mother, had immigrated immigrated to this country in the twenties, and uh, this so these women. Are, like my mother, came from West Hoboken, but like my mother, they had moved to Fresno. My mother had moved to Fresno during the 70s. My brother moved out here, and my mother retired, and she came and moved to Fresno. And, and uh, so, uh, where I would visit her, I've been living in Berkeley. And um, so I imagined uh, these four old Armenian women like my mother, who uh, came from West Hoboken, were now living in Fresno, and they're sitting by a by a vineyard, a grape yard, a uh, grape vineyard, and they're reminiscing, reminiscing about their life in West Hoboken, but also about the massacre which they survived too, like my mother, and. Uh, and so there are four of them, and I'm going to read, as I read, I'm just going to read vo their voices, but you've got to imagine that there are four of them speaking. And, uh, and uh, I have a little picture here uh, of actually from an old photo, family photo of, of three of these women when they were young. And, and the fourth one is taking the picture. Okay, so I'm going to read the, the, the chorus uh, that's, intersp that's interspersed throughout the knob. You have to imagine that four of them are speaking. This is the first one, first, first chorus. <clears throat> Tell me the truth. Do I smell of piss? Now, they're all old now, see? They're in their 80s. Uh, no, not so far. Thank goodness. I used to smell it on Avni before she died. I wanted to tell her, but I didn't want to hurt her feelings. I used to smell it too. She used to wash her underwear every day, but it was not enough. I go through 20 pair of underwear a week. Good thing I have a dryer. What would my neighbors think if they saw all of all them on the line? 
Well, thank God you can still wash them yourself. You said it. I'd rather leak piss in my own house than wear a diaper in one of those other, other places. My children said they never let me, they'll never let me go to one of those places. They all say that. I never heard of those places when I was young. Whoever started them let the dog shit in his father's mouth. They're not so bad. They stink and you know it. Everywhere stinks if your ass is shitty. Just like the lag lag. What lag lag? The lag lag with the shitty ass. The lag lag is a, means a, a duck. Uh, in Armenia. Every time, every time he'd fly to a lake, he would say it stinks here, and everywhere he went would stink because he would stink. Let's talk about something else. Bring some pumpkin seeds. I want to do something else with my mouth. No, we must keep talking. Talking is good for us, no matter what we talk about. I'd like to get a job in one of those hamburger places. She's got more money than a pasha and now she wants to be a servant. You don't even know how to write. How are you going to write the orders? I don't have to work in the front. I can work in the back. I can wash dishes. They're not going to hire someone your age. This isn't the village. Old people don't work in this country. Young people can't even find work. Diamond Ring Zakar owns some of those places. Maybe he can give you a job. I wouldn't work for Diamond Ring if I were you. He's not an easy boss. He was a slave himself when he was a child. Was he one too? His mother left him under a tree before she was slaughtered. Some Kurds got him and made him a slave. He lived with them for some years before he escaped. He's a good boy. He can't help it if he loves money. So what good did it do him? He waited till he was 50 to marry and then to one who couldn't have a child. I wonder who he'll leave his money to. The government will get it. Let them have it. They were good to him. Why should they get it? They don't know how to use it. I don't care what happens to it. Just don't give any to me. I have enough trouble giving away what I have. Then why do you want to make more? It's not for the money. She wants to be about, around young people. Young people don't want to be around us. They think we have some kind of disease. My garbage man is young and he always stops for a cup of coffee in my garage. In your garage? Why sure? Didn't you know my garage is a coffee house? That was a good idea, putting a stove in your garage. Why, sure. Who wants to sit in the house? I pull the door up and I'm open to the street. That's what everyone does on my street. They live in the garage all the time. I wouldn't be able to talk to my garbage man if I was inside. I give him coffee and chodag whenever he comes. He's good to me. He takes all my garbage, no matter how much I have. In Fresno, especially in the summer, the garage stores are always open and you can see people working in there doing whatever. It's, it's a, the, you know, the, the houses are built so that the garage is facing the street. <clears throat> where was your mother buried? I don't know where my mother was buried. My mother was buried in a ditch outside Damascus. I don't know where my mother was buried, but I know where her brother died. He went to Soviet Armenia and then he starved to death. I remember my mother a little. I remember she used to hit me a lot. She must have been a young mother. I remember my father saying, you hit a donkey when it doesn't move, but you don't have to hit a child. I wish I could remember my mother. I wish I knew what she looked like. She didn't look like us, I'll tell you that. She was too young to look like us.
I dreamt of my husband last night. Was it a sex dream? Not really. We just hugged and kissed. Did he give you something? It's good if the dead give you something, but it's bad if they take something away. We just kissed. How old was he? He was young. How old were you? I guess I was young too. He was a good boy. He could have lived a little longer. He drank too much. No, he didn't. But he liked his arach. They all liked their arach. That's because it was Zivat's arach. She was the best bootlegger around. Her whole house used to stink every harvest time. The Italians would be making wine and she would be soaking raisins and that whole house used to stink like sea caucus. Sea caucus doesn't stink anymore, at least that's what they say. How would anyone know? Everybody's gone. In my village we ate almonds in the spring when the nut was like milk and the green shell still soft. I don't remember much about where I lived. I remember my hometown very well. I can even tell you the names of the streets. They don't have those names anymore. The Muslims live there now. They're supposed to be very poor. Let them be poor and more poor. Don't say that. They don't know what happened. They weren't even born then. So what? So have compassion. For a filthy Muslim who lives in my father's house? You don't want that house anyway. You got a better house here. I got two houses here, so what? So let them live there. They have no right to live there. Let my own people live there. Who? Not me. I'd go for a visit. What for? She misses her almonds. I have an almond tree in my backyard. Not for the almonds, for the river. What river? The river where I played when I was a child. Oh, you and your river. I remember Lucia's body in the bathhouse. She was so beautiful she felt ashamed. She didn't feel ashamed. The old women made her feel ashamed. What mouths they had. Now, now we have them. Do we? My grandmother doesn't even wear a bazier, and do I say anything? When I was her age, I couldn't even shave my legs without the old women calling me a whore. What happened to the bathhouse? I think it's a Cuban restaurant now. I remember the horse stables in the back of it and the smell of horse shit. How much fun we had there. Now men and women sit together, everything showing even between their legs. They just sit in a big tub. Do they make music? I don't know what they do. They smoke dope. Good, let them smoke dope. My son-in-law put one of those jacuzzis in his bathroom. Oh yeah, I want one too. I don't need any jacuzzi. I like a good kisa on my body. You can't get that flaxen cloth anymore. My granddaughter wants one. She likes old-fashioned stuff. She has a beautiful body, your granddaughter. I hope it's not too beautiful. Look what happened to Lucia. It's not easy to be beautiful. My mother had to smear herself with shit so they wouldn't rape her. My granddaughter doesn't have to do that. They learn to fight now. They do that Japanese stuff. I saw on the news a woman who broke a man's nose when he tried to rape her. Good for her. Good for her. Did they catch him? Yes, they caught him in the hospital when he went for his nose. We can go to Lake Tahoe for $60 and they give us back 30 to spend. Araknaz went to the, with the church group. The bus, the motel, the food, everything for $30. They want people to gamble. They know once people start, they don't want to stop. There's nothing else to do there anyway. You said it. When I was in Las Vegas, I stood at the machine all day. No, 
Alecnaz kept the $30 and walked around and then went to bed at 8 o'clock. But she said she had a good time. She said she ate shrimp and they were as big as her finger. Let's go. $30. It's nothing. What do you think? They throw money in the streets in this country. Whenever my son has pennies in his pocket, he throws them in the street. They throw food in the street. Adeknaz didn't. She put what she couldn't finish in a napkin and brought it home and ate it for lunch the next day. I hope they have shrimp again. I like shrimp. My husband loved all fish. He was from his Istanbul. He never ate meat, only fish. His own brother was a fisherman before he was slaughtered. I didn't know they slaughtered us in Istanbul too. He was in the underground. My uncle was in the underground too. I remember visiting him in jail. I was the only one allowed because I was so young. Yavram, he said, don't ever forget who you are. Promise me you will never forget who you are. And I had to promise him that I would always remember who I am. My, grandf my grandson's girlfriend came the other day to write recipes. She wants to cook for him, but she's an all dad. I told her, you have to live with me and cook with me to learn these foods. What kind of ordat is she? Ordat is um, the Armenian word for other, which means everybody who is not Armenian. What kind of ordat is she? I don't know. She says she's American. They all say that. I asked her what kind of American, and she said a little of this and a little of that as if she were a recipe. There are no Americans. They just say that to make themselves feel like they're somebody. There won't be any more of us either. Not if we marry a part of this and a part of that. We will be gone when we lose the language. Why should anyone want to keep the language? The language is everything. It gives us history. I don't like history. Let us be a part of this and a part of that. It's safer. What are you saying? Did my father die for nothing? I don't know why your father died. He died because he would not become a Muslim. So they ripped his nails out and slit him open with a butcher knife. That's better than being a Muslim? They would have done that even if he did become a Muslim. They ripped my baby daughter from my arms and threw her in the river. Do you think I could ever be a Muslim after that? They did something else to me. Christians do those things too. I'm not Muslim and I'm not Christian. What are you then? I'm a grandmother, that's what I am. <clears throat> Hiripsima is going. She's not the same Ripsima. Sometimes she's the same and then she slips away. Well, she made it this far. Maybe she'll make it to 90. She's already 90. Well, then 95. 90 is far enough. It's too far if I can't go to the toilet by myself. She's strong. She'll make it to 95. She wants to see her granddaughter get married. Her children keep her alive. She lives for them. Didn't she have two others? She had two who died in a desert. She said she wanted to die then, but she didn't. And now she wants to live. It depends on how she feels. I know that feeling. Sometimes I wake up and I want to live, and sometimes I want to go back to sleep. If I don't work, I get sleepy. I start to eat, and then I get sleepy. What are you working on now? Rags. Rags? Yes, rags. Can you imagine that? My granddaughter wants a quilt made out of a patchwork of rags. It took me all my life to get out of rags, and now my granddaughter wants to sleep in them. Aske has a cousin who grew up in China. She speaks Chinese with her children. I heard there are some of us who made it to the end of Argentina. Where is Argentina? It's at the end of the world somewhere. Do they keep their names? Some of us don't keep our names. My name isn't my name anyway. It comes from a Muslim word. 
As long as it has our ending, it's okay. Everyone knows who we are by the IAN. Some of us in this town didn't want the IAN. They took the IAN off and even changed their names. How come? We were like dogs in this town while you and I were living back east. The signs here in Fresno, which is actually the truth, the signs here used to say no dogs or Armenians. Now we are the ones who own the signs and they say no blacks and no Mexicans. They do? Why sure, you think we're any different? The blacks and the Mexicans will own the sign someday and I wonder what they'll say then. Some of us could pass for blacks or Mexicans. Jackknife Nishan had hair so kinky he could pass for a black in the summertime. The way you eat hot peppers you could pass for a Mexican. What about Indians? We used to play Indians in the movies. That's because of our big noses. I wonder how we got these noses. Once there's a big nose in a family, it never goes away. <laughs> Maybe the Indians got their noses in the same place. The, the Chechens were like Indians. You lived with the Chechens, didn't you? I lived with them for three years. After my family was slaughtered, they took me for a slave. I spoke Chechen, I ate Chechen, and I would have had a Chechen child now if I hadn't escaped. How did you escape? I didn't really escape. There were merchants that passed over our plateau, and I would give them notes to take with them. I would write my name and where I was. I did that too. I would have done that, but I couldn't write. I learned how to write just in time. I had already been in school when that Chechen grabbed me and took me away on his horse. So did you find your notes? So did anyone find your notes? You know who found one of my notes? You know old Harry the Iceman? Why sure, he used to come to my house all the time with his pick in the ice and the burlap dripping on his shoulder. Well, he found my note and he came to get me, but he had no money. He had no money when he came and they would not give him to me. They would not give me to him. So he had to go back. And I had to wait another six months before he had enough to buy me from them. I think he gave them about $10. Can you speak Chechen now? Not a word. Sometimes in my dreams I speak Chechen, but when I wake, I can't remember a word. They shot another diplomat. Who? Those who come from Beirut. They grow up with shooting in Beirut. While I was writing this book, there was a civil war in Beirut. <clears throat> they grow up with shooting in Beirut. Did they kill him? No, they just wounded him. They should have killed him. There were young Armenian boys in the 70s who were uh, who did shoot Turkish dip diplomats they should have killed him what are you saying do you know what you're saying of course I know what I'm saying what good is it to kill the poor man he's not a poor man he's a Muslim he doesn't know what happened he wasn't even born then then he should know they all should know she's right something must be done too many years have gone by and nothing has been done. What do you want to be done? I want them to admit what they did. What for? So everyone knows. So everyone knows, so what? So then it's a beginning. They can begin to pay us back. How are they going to pay us back? I don't care if they pay us back or not as long as they know. My granddaughter knows. She wants to join the underground. Does she want to shoot diplomats? She wants to fight for her race. She just wants to fight. No, she grew up with the stories. Who told her those stories? What kind of stories are they for children? They like to hear those kinds of stories. The Jews play their stories over and over again. 
There are stories. Our grandchildren should know them. So they can hate and kill? Not to hate and kill, to know where they came from. They came from television. They all come from killing and sex. Not all of them. All of them and all of us, we all come from killing and sex. In my village, the Muslim had a right to sleep with a Christian bride on a wedding night. But he never did, really. Yes, he did. At least once, anyway. I won't say her name, but she had to go his to his house and be deflowered by him before she could sleep with her husband. Those filth. Now there are no more virgins, anyway. Now they don't even get married. They marry and they divorce and they marry and they divorce. Let them divorce. I would have divorced if I could have. You're not the only one. No, I love my husband. I love my husband too, but I still would have divorced him. I was married to mine six months before we slept together. How old were you? I was 15. See, these were picture brides. It's better that way. Let them learn fast. My great-granddaughter knows more than I do, and she's only 13. They teach it in school. That's good. Now they won't be jackasses like us. It won't make any difference. Everybody has to learn for themselves. I'm sorry for young people today. Everyone learns in their own way. We had our suffering and they have theirs. I wonder what I would have become if I was born in this country. I think you would have been a movie star. You think so? Sure, why not? Your nose is too big, but they can fix that. No one's going to fix this nose. This is my father's nose. I wonder if I could have been a big shot if I were born here. You already are a big shot. Remember that Persian lamb coat she had? Only big shots wore those coats. No, I mean a big shot like Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt was a miserable woman. How do you know? I heard it on the television. All I want is health. Oh, you and your health. You have to enjoy yourself too. The only enjoyment I know is my children. You see them once a year. They're too busy worrying about how to have a good time. They have so much and still they're miserable. It's a shame the way they live now. If everyone lived like you, we'd still be in a village. What's wrong with the village? I like it better here. I go to Las Vegas. I go to Tao. Who wants to go back to the village? It was like a village when I first came to this country. Where are you talking about? In Binghamton, New York. My cousin had a farm there. I don't know any Binghamton. Not a week after Ellis Island, I was in the factory. Oh, America, everyone said on the boat, as if we were going to heaven. That's what Pinochle Nishan said on the boat. He said, do you think I'm going to America to work? He was a gambler. He had a cafe. It's the same thing. My husband used to play cards in his cafe all night. All the boys did. I used to complain, but what else were they going to do? Sit in the kitchen? My mother's kitchen was always full. My mother-in-law's kitchen was always full. That's because she made eyelach in the bathtub. I used to hate it. I can still smell the stink of those raisins in the barrel. People, people came all the way from Patterson to buy her eyelach. She had a good idea. Maybe I should make eyelach in my bathtub, and then my kitchen will be full at night. You need more than eyelach to fill your kitchen with people. I don't want my kitchen full. I can hardly keep it clean. My house is too big for me to clean. We should all live in our garages. I live with my husband and four children in an apartment that was not half the size of the house I live alone in now. Peter? Yeah. Yeah, we've got to wrap up. It's 1.30. All right. Thank you. Thank you.